And joining us now with her take on Zero Tolerance, the author of Zero Sum, Mary Rogan, in the December issue of Walrus Magazine, which we show to the camera for people's edification in case they want to read about your adventure. Mary, welcome to TVO. Thank you. You have a heck of a story here, and we're going to go through it bit by bit, okay? Okay, terrific. Uh, usually the best place is to start at the beginning, and that's what we're going to do. 1992. Yep. You sought help from a therapist. That's right. How come? Um, you know, I think a lot of women in their early 30s go through sort of predictable things. They have children, they get married. Um, in my case, I also, um, my father passed away just six weeks after my son was born. So I had a li lot of life changes going on, um, and I felt a bit adrift. And there were also issues from the past that quickly came up, as is often the case. Mm -hmm. um, and you met your therapist and decided, yes, she's the right one for me to help me because why? Um, I, I think because she seemed um, kind, which I think is important, um, but she also seemed and, and is very intelligent, um, and um, it just felt like a good fit in terms of being able to talk to her. You soon discovered that this good fit is more than just professional. At, at what point did that happen? Well into it. I mean, you know, um, she was my therapist for um, nine years. Well, 92, yeah, I guess, eight, nine years. Um, and it was, you know, probably six or seven years before that started to shift and it became apparent that there was more there than a professional relationship. Personal feelings? Absolutely, yes. On both sides? Um, I didn't ask her, right? Um, you felt them first? I fe yes, I would say I probably did. I think, um, you know, when you're looking at this kind of relationship, I probably felt more free to have those feelings. Um, right. than she would feel. Because they um, would be forbidden to a professional like her normally, right? Well, acting on them would be forbidden. Having them would be normal. Um, and they would be encouraged to discuss them with another psychiatrist or a supervisor, generally, from what I understand. Okay, so you're obviously feeling that this relationship with your psychiatrist is moving into a less professional, more personal area. Yes. Who initiated moving who initiated doing something about that? Well, we talked a lot about it, and I mentioned that in the article. I think that, you know, um, in some ways it was a very ordinary love affair, and in lots of ways it wasn't, beginning with the fact that she was my psychiatrist. So it, it, it couldn't be showing up at her doorstep with flowers. We had to talk about it in, in, a, in a sort of, um, uh, sort of um, clinical way, I suppose. Clinical? Um, that doesn't sound romantic. Well, you know... Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Um, what I mean is we had to talk about it in a clinical setting, okay. so that would be more accurate. Um, okay. But we had to talk about it in terms of, you know, there were prohibitions to this, um, and there's lots of literature about it. Um, some that would say it's, it's all transference, this is all in your head, you know, this is, um, you know, you're, you're, you don't really feel this way. Um, and then there are people who would say yes, and, and certainly there's a long history, especially in psychoanalysis, where, um, you know, doctors became involved and married their patients. Mm -hmm. um, and then things shifted. So it, it, it didn't begin the way that it, it, it certainly was in 19, well, in 2001. Um, okay, Bef before we go on and talk about the sort of forbidden aspects of this, professionally speaking, we should just establish for everybody, you were married to your husband. Common law husband. Common law husband, That's right. right. Your psychiatrist, a woman, was married to her husband. That's right. You had three, ch she had two kids, you had one kid, right? And she has two children. She has two children. You That's have right. one child. Right. And you discussed uh, ending your respective marriages so that the two of you could get together. It, it became very clear that Barbara and I lived in different worlds, right? So she had, you know, she was part of this environment where all of this was understood, and, and there was a lot of there's a lot of apprehension when you talk to other psychiatrists and doctors in general. The College of Physicians and Surgeons is, is like a boogeyman to them. Um, and for me, it seemed, oh, you know, well, if we just explain our situation, you know, they'll be fine with it, which is, you know, partly because, you know, Boy, is that naive? That, well, You're a journalist. You're I not know, supposed to be that naive. Yeah, I know, but I figure, you know, people, if you just get a chance, you know, put me in front of somebody, I'll, I'll, I'll explain it to them, you know, they'll eyeball me, I'll eyeball them, and we'll see that, you know, it's all good, which was incredibly naive. Um, so when we talked about it, I was like, you know, this won't be a problem, trust me. And Barbara was like, You're crazy. This is going to be a big problem. It's going to cost me my job, she might have said. She said, It's going to cost yeah. me my career. I'm never going to work again. And, you know, and I said that you're overreacting. But in fact, you know, that's, that's what, you know, we came close to having have, you know, ha happen. How did it actually get to the attention of the College of Physicians and Surgeons in the first place? Well, it's an interesting story because I think um, 
people are required, other uh, medical professions under the existing guidelines are required to report it, uh, a situation like this because as the college saw it, that it, it, it must be sexual abuse. That by definition, if a doctor has a relationship with an ex-patient. They're taking advantage. They're taking advantage. And so anyone who comes to, who hears that story is obligated to mandatory reporting or they risk losing their license. So what happened was a number of doctors, I mean, Barbara's a doctor, she knows other doctors, we, you know, and we, we were accessing services. Um, they had to make mandatory reports. And a number of those came in and the college did nothing. Um, and uh, almost a, I guess almost a year went by. Um, and one of the people who had made a mandatory report was the psychiatrist of my ex-husband. And he made a second report um, expressing to the college that uh, he wasn't happy. His, his client, his patient, my ex-husband, uh, wasn't happy with the fact that the college hadn't taken steps to address this. I thought this was all supposed to be confidential. Well, all of this would, would have, was made known to both Barbara and I when it came before the college and, and we saw the discovery. So at that point, the college has to release all of the information that they have about us and about this case. So, so there was a chronology right there for us right. to see. And I found that quite shocking, actually, that they were prepared to do nothing until they heard that there was someone who was disgruntled, someone outside of the profession, i.e. my ex-husband. Who may have had a bit of an interest in the, in the situation Absolutely. as well. Absolutely. So okay. at that point, they said, you know, we need to get on this, and they sent an investigator to our house. And what happened then? Guy knocked on the door. Um, you know, he called first and, um, you know, said you're being investigated, and um, he left a voicemail. And, and Investigated for what? Barbara was being investigated for sexual abuse of a patient. I see. And mm -hmm. so he came, asked a lot of questions. You got interviewed? Yeah, he came to the house, and, and, and I think he was surprised that we asked him in, but I said, you know, this is ridiculous. Like, at some point, we just got to sort of, you know, sort of, knuckle up and you know see what's going to happen and I again I naively thought well this is an opportunity just to tell the story and and once we tell it they'll be fine because they'll ask me questions and I'll be able to reassure them that I've made this decision this is a this is a, a life-changing decision that we've both made together so you welcomed the inquiry in some respects I did you didn't realize that they were kind of looking at this as a major violation of the zero tolerance uh, rules of the, of the profession. I think, I think, you know, intellectually I understood that and I, and I certainly knew the, the sort of, you know, how they generally operated, but I didn't really believe that they would not speak to me. It, it didn't occur to me that they wouldn't speak to me. Did you think that their job was to come there and basically ruin your significant other? Um, I don't, I, I think, I certainly know that Barbara felt under siege r right up until they asked for my chart. I just assumed that they would, that this would be a process, that this would be a dialogue. I just assumed that. It seemed the most sensible way to move forward. And I didn't, I didn't let go of that until I had to. Hmm. So. Well, speaking of moving forward, let me read an excerpt here from the Journal of Medical Ethics. Here's issue 31 in 2005, which says, there is no evidence to suggest that harm following a failed relationship with a health professional is any different to that resulting from the breakup of a relationship with a non-health professional. Personally, we do not doubt that intimate relationships between doctor and patient have the potential to be harmful to patients, as is the case in any other interpersonal relationship, and can have negative effects on patients' future ability to establish a trusting relationship with a doctor. But cases like yours, I guess, have uh, encouraged the college to kind of move from its zero tolerance, absolutely no relationship verboten between doctor and patient to something a little less strict. Isn't that fair to say? I think so. I mean, I can't know what's in their minds. It certainly, it, it would be a, a, an enormous coincidence that, that this case, you know, presented such a challenge to them. And in mm -hmm. fact, they didn't revoke Barbara's license permanently, which would have been the standard at the time. Um, I think there are a number of things that would, that would lend itself to their change of heart. The first being the nuances involved in our case and the fact that I'm, you know, a person who can advocate for myself and, and, and I clearly was not a complainant. I think the also the other thing is that at the core of their policy, and it's an interesting quote that you bring up because it reflects something that I felt, which is, you know, relationships go belly up all the time, marriages end all the time, and it's awful. It's really hard mm -hmm. for everybody. Um, and everyone, when they fall in love, quickly discovers that, you know, the, the guy or the gal is, is not 
in all the ways, you know, the, the perfect person that they thought they were. I mean, we're all suffering from transference at that level. Um, but I think the, the thing that's important and, and that doctors have had to face and the colleges had to face is that underlying their theory is this idea that doctors are so powerful and that patients are so weak and that there's this inherent power imbalance that I don't think exists anymore. I can Google, I can find out a million things about myself and then go to my doctor and say, have you thought about doing this test? I mean, times are changing. Yeah, but, the, but what's now allowed that, say, wouldn't have been allowed 10 years ago if the circumstances were the same? In terms of their zero tolerance? Yeah. Um, well, in, you know, in 2001, when, when we were getting together, um, all doctors were prohibited from having personal relationships with anyone that they had come in contact with in a professional role. So if I were an orthopod and I set your broken arm, you know, on a weekend when you were being a weekend warrior, we couldn't, we could never date. Because there's that previous established doctor-patient relationship. Because I set your arm, and, you know, and, 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 and so therefore I hold the keys to the kingdom of your psyche, apparently. <laughs> and so, um, and if we wanted to date, we'd have to wait a year. A year, right. Psychiatrists, it was presumed, because there was such a delicate relationship, they could never date a former patient. What's changed? Um, now, doctors, there's no waiting period for doctors in general, and psychiatrists, there's no longer a lifetime ban in, in, uh, on dating a former patient. That's a lot. Those are big changes. Positive ones, you think? I think so, absolutely. Because I think, you know, and I, and I really want to stress this, and I stressed it in the article. I, I also, you know, I think the quote addresses that. It's not beyond my imagination to imagine that someone could be devastated in a relationship with, with a, a medical professional, mm -hmm. someone who had been their doctor. And it's not beyond my imagination to know that doctors, you know, could abuse their privilege. So could a lawyer, so could a teacher, so could your plumber. I mean, I think, you know, people, you know, I, I accept that people have the ability and, and the potential to be abusive. I don't think it's a good starting point. I don't think it's a good place to start in terms of how we look at people, right? I, um, think, I think, personally, we need to wrap this up by finding out, so what's, you know, What's happened with Barbara? She's still practicing psychiatry. Yep, she was. She her license was was suspended um, for 12 months, three of which they they waived. If she if she did, did a boundaries and an ethics course, which she did, she resumed her private practice. They placed no restrictions on her whatsoever. They didn't ask you know that she be supervised. So there was a lot to indicate that you know they knew that this was not a, a, a situation that was abusive. Um, she is back in private practice and happy. Um, and you two are still together. We're still together. And we have been for? Uh, since 2001. We got married. Um, uh, You're formally married. We're formally married um, shortly after the legislation allowed. We've raised, you know, my son has lived with us. This happened when he was 10. Um, and he's lived with us full time since then. And he's off at university now. You know, I mean, and I say that in the story, you know, there's, there, it, it was hellish, to be honest. It was a hellish process to go through with the college um, for me personally. Um, but, you know. You've moved I, the yardsticks, and how do you feel about it? I think it's good. I think it's absolutely good. And, and, and I think we're going to see more and more of that. I think people are capable of nuance. They're capable of sort of, you know, making decisions for themselves. Um, and, you know, for me, I feel like writing the article was the end of, you know, it put the period at the end of a sentence and moving forward and happy to do that. You can read more about Mary's experiences in the December issue of The Walrus Magazine, December 209. Zero Sum is the name of her piece. Mary, good of you to visit us at TVO tonight. My Thanks. pleasure. Thank you.